not a con. My name is Mark Ansbury, and I'm the Chief Operating Officer for One Cleveland. And uh, before I jump into the entire presentation, I probably don't have to do this with this group, but uh, I'd like to do a little role playing. Imagine that you're a young, starving musical artist, and you have the opportunity to study from a master, whether he's a violin player or a piano player. Uh, imagine that you can do that every day. And it doesn't matter where you are. Imagine that you can listen to an orchestra where half of it's in New York and half of it's in San Francisco. Imagine that you can visit not only the art museum, but create a virtual tour and, and walk through that tour and work with people from other segments of the country that annotate, deliberate, and communicate the value and the creation of that art and where it came from. And imagine the opportunity to be able to do this from everywhere. Now, you guys, coming from a technology band, understand this, right? You, 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 you already envisioned this world. But the hard part of envisioning the world is the practical application of the technology and the ubiquitous deployment of technology to enable those things to happen, not only at major universities, not only at major institutions, but to happen in smaller communities. And the whole objective of One Cleveland is the concept of creating community networking. Being able to facilitate from a ground up collaboration, sharing of resources, be able to expand capacity so that bandwidth is no longer a barrier to facilitating innovative applications and services, to open the doors to high definition television, whether it's in your home or whether it's in the classroom or it's in your office. Uh, the ability to provide uh, broadband communications so that you could actually have a live orchestra play in the classroom from hundreds or thousands of miles away. So, one Cleveland, <coughs> which is the brainchild of Lev Gonick, who is the CIO over at Case Western, was a concept to bring the community together to collaborate and share and develop the infrastructure that would enable, enable the opportunities, enable the technology enable us to stop thinking about the barriers of telecommunications but open up our minds to enabling and transforming the community. So that's what I'm going to spend a little time telling you about what we're trying to do, what we're trying to accomplish as a community infrastructure, what we're trying to evolve here in Greater Cleveland which is expanding even beyond the reach of Cleveland. <coughs> um, one Cleveland, just a little background here, we're a nonprofit organization. Um, our whole focus is on developing uh, community-based services, on creating opportunities to enable collaboration, innovation, and to basically expand the opportunity to give the, uh, the members of our service the ability to think outside the box and to actually uh, implement and deploy applications that you can only dream about. We're looking at the next uh, generation of digital infrastructure that serves, hopefully, as a competitive advantage as well, because one of the opportunities, once you can get creative, is you create an economic development model for the community, you create an attractor for the community. You create opportunities to do business in ways that you never thought you could before. So there's a big advantage to the region by developing and deploying this kind of service infrastructure. We can optimize, and, and there's really a, a value proposition here when we say optimize. Uh, is that there are tremendous treasures in our community and, and a lot of us don't even know they exist. We have one of the top museums in the country on par with the Guggenheim and a lot of people don't even know we have that museum that it sits in our backyard. Uh, we have some of the top musicians, top orchestra recognized outside of our community but we don't even take advantage of that and leverage that opportunity within our community. We have these tremendous assets and resources that we're not leveraging, that we're not using within our own community. So we have NASA in the backyard who does some very interesting uh, you know, educational outreach. We're not leveraging it in our own community. We're not taking advantage of these assets. The other part of that is, is we're not, not only are we not taking advantage, we're not recognizing the aggregation, what the value proposition by bringing those assets together in a way they can collaborate and share and utilize those resources in very innovative and new ways. 
And whether that's the museum, whether it's the higher education research, whether it's the uh, healthcare system, there's, there's a lot of interesting technology information that's available that could be used in very creative ways that's locked away in someone's vault. And the opportunity here that we have is to create and bridge the gap between these types of institutions so we can share and collaborate and use information more effectively and create innovative uh, applications. <clears throat> our goal in our community is to accelerate the adoption of technology. We want it to move faster. I mean, we're all sitting here, hey, who wants wireless everywhere? Who wants, you know, the ability to get broadband no matter where you're, you're at? And we all want that kind of thing, but how does it happen? How does it get there? And we see it in the hot spots. You see it in the coffee shop. You see it in the hotel. Uh, you know, but you don't see it in a lot of places where people really can, you know, use, really see an opportunity to change the paradigm by which they operate. You know, we're forced to go within traditional confines of buildings, and we're forced to go in conventional refined, uh, uh, confines of, you know, your corporations or your home to get that kind of access. So, oops, sorry about that, guys. Um, so anyway, our, our real goal in what we believe is, is very imperative in our community is we have to reinvent the community. We have to change the way we work. We have to look at this as a knowledge economy. We have to change that paradigm. So we, we've really created a model that we think is really a, a three-phased approach to doing this. One is to connect. We have to connect the community. We have to take down the barriers of high-cost broadband technology. We have to take that out of the equation. We have to open the doors to bandwidth and capacity so people are no longer worried about getting access to those resources. They're now thinking about the innovative things they can do with those resources. We have to look at the opportunity to enable the community. The community, by and large, is not really understand what's out there. They don't know what some of you guys know about the technology and how you can integrate and incorporate that and change the paradigm. We have to enable that community. We have to bring the technology and the opportunities together with the people that you know think in very traditional ways, very linear, very vertical ways, and, and break down those barriers for them. We have to marry them with technology. We have to marry them with innovators. We have to marry them with applications. We have to give them the ability to envision the opportunity so that we can take the next step and really look at transforming the way the community works and the way we do business. So we look at this, we've got to connect, we begin the enablement process and we begin to transform our community. And that is the goal of One Cleveland, is to help be a catalyst, a facilitator, an engager. And that's really kind of an important part there, an engager. Engaging people to talk to other people like you guys are doing. I mean, you guys are bringing people from all over to talk, to communicate, to share, to collaborate. We've got to get our own communities to be able to do this kind of stuff. To get the neighbor next door to talk to, you know, and get the hospital at uh, one end of the city to talk to the hospital at the other end of the city. To get the hospitals to communicate with the education and research departments. We've got to break down some of our own internal barriers in order to facilitate innovation and creation. So, what we have, um, and to give you some idea, one of the things that Lev Gonick did uh, in the early days of Case Western has identified the, uh, the opportunities about three years ago of fiber that existed in our region. And what happened, of course, in the uh, late 90s, uh, you know, everybody started building fiber. Cleveland was actually at the crux of a lot of fiber. We had fiber coming down from the northern routes from Chicago and going to the Midwest, and we, were, we became an intersection point. So we had a lot of fiber that was built out that was unused, untapped, and we had companies that were sitting there with this rich asset and didn't know what to do with it. So we were very opportunistic. Uh, we went to these companies and we said, hey, can you make some of this available? We'll help you create a, a opportunity. We'll create an economic model that works for you, and we'll create demand in the community for broadband services. Because as everybody you guys know in dealing with common carriers, they don't build out until there's an ROI, until they can make some money by doing that. And some of the problem there is we live at a, at a time where the economy is very bad in, in the greater Cleveland area. Jobs are being lost, and it's not just Cleveland, it's everywhere, but Cleveland is extremely depressed and is at the bottom of most lists when you look at other cities. So we saw the uh, ability to use this fiber as a lever 
as a catalyst to develop new tools, new applications, new businesses to become an economic development uh, catalyst for the community. So what we did is, you see the red here, these are fiber rings that are around the greater Cleveland area. And then what you see in green is some other fiber that we're working on getting donated to the community. And we are creating a regional network. And what we're doing is we're creating this based on community applications and community participation. We're getting participation from the higher ed. We're getting participation from the healthcare institutes. We're getting participation from school districts, from nonprofits, from city, from municipal governments, from the county to participate in the development and the deployment of what we call ultra broadband capabilities uh, in our region. So we really are, believe it or not, one of the first community networks to really take advantage of this as a community driven event rather than as a departmental event. It's not one silo, it's the community coming together to create this service and to be able to share and collaborate in the use of this service. And that's, that's really a paradigm shift too because what we're saying in that process is we're bringing a lot of resources from a lot of institutions together which traditionally haven't communicated with each other to develop, deploy, and utilize these broadband services. So in even an expansion model, we're moving into now a, a more of a regional model. And this just to give you an idea, Cuyahoga County, which is right in the center, there are about 1,400 nonprofits at schools, hospitals, city seats, county government, et cetera, locations in just the Cuyahoga County, just mapping those out. There are a lot of institutions that can benefit from the use of broadband services that could benefit from the opportunity to create new applications that serve the community. Um, and we've been pulled into most recently moving down into Summit County and Akron Canton and in the Youngstown and that's where you see the green fiber come into place because now it's allowing us to span the ultra broadband capability out into those communities. And in the process, what we've been doing is developing relationships with folks like Adelphia and Time Warner to facilitate broadband extensions off of our fiber so that we really can create a more ubiquitous reach out to the community, uh, out to the regions that don't have access to the kind of fiber assets that we have in the greater Cleveland area. <clears throat> the other aspect of this kind of what I call community networking in the regional expansion model is we have the ability to connect with other resources. So things like the National Lambda Rail. Um, the National Lambda Rail architecture is, is basically fiber infrastructure that's shared by leading research institutions throughout the uh, U.S. Uh, there's about 26 institutions, I believe, that are participating in this network. We, Cleveland, are a member of that, and we are participating on that National Lambda Rail. And those of you that might be familiar with Internet 2, uh, you know, the research network that's largely used by higher ed and, and a lot of medical research institutions. This is a evolution of that and in fact the members of Internet 2 are participating in the expansion of the National Lambda Rail to create the next generation of digital architecture so that we can do more innovative things uh, across the nation. So, um, so this is one of the opportunities we get by aggregating resources within our region and our community. By interconnecting then with national and, and other resources, we're creating a gateway. We're creating an opportunity for the, the greater Cleveland area and this community to take advantage of a much broader digital infrastructure. And our real focus uh, as an organization is to uh, target health care, education, research, e-government, and nonprofits. What we're trying to do here is look at these as individual vertical markets, but we're looking at points of intersection between those markets. We're looking at ways that we can create collaboration and sharing of resources and connecting these institutions at gigahertz plus you know, kinds of speeds, be able to um, really expand their ability to uh, develop innovative multimedia interactive applications and services that benefit the community. Um, and uh, uh, right now we have participation from all of these communities and we have about 18 major subscribers in our region and are expanding very rapidly uh, throughout our community. 
and we're connecting non-traditional types of organizations. We're connecting the museums, uh, the Institute of Music, Museum of uh, Institute of Music, the uh, higher eds with the healthcare institutions, with the city government, with county. Uh, we're now beginning to participate with statewide initiatives that expand the reach into our community and to other institutions. All of this to facilitate the interoperability and the interaction of these organizations so that we can begin to provide more effective e-government services to the community, uh, better health care, better health education. And we're seeing collaboration now between educational health care institutions. I'm working on a project with uh, Metro Health and Cuyahoga Community College to develop a, a health care educational outreach. Part of this addressing the digital divide issues, addressing the issues of disparity and what we'll call cultural education because a lot of you that communicate with people all over the world know there's this big divide not just well the technology is one thing and it might connect you but there's a cultural divide between people that also needs to be bridged and gapped in a number of key areas and in the area of health care that that's a big focus right now is to be able to address that digital divide issue be able to you know cross the cultural barrier and be able to provide services that they can uh, benefit from So one of the examples that I like to use is by enabling collaboration, what we're able to do here is to uh, tie different organizations together. One of the first projects we got a grant for, the, uh, the Cleveland Museum of Art, uh, got a grant to deliver high definition television out to the libraries. The whole idea here of doing this was to create not only a virtual tour, tour type of model so that you can see the art and participate in a walkthrough of an art museum, but to create a storytelling exercise. You know, part of the problem with a lot of rich media is that it's out there, it's not archived very well, people don't know where it's at, don't know how to get it, it's not easily accessible, it's maybe not shared. And what we're trying to do is create a mechanism that we can create a real digital asset management type of infrastructure so we can make these kinds of, of things much more readily available. And then create a model of incorporating those digital assets into storytelling exercises. So the library's working on developing the storyline so that we can educate teachers how to incorporate art into the classroom and give them real world visibility into the art. So if they go through the art museum one day, they can go away the next day, they can actually take a virtual tour, but not only do the virtual tour, but interact with uh, the potential artist and interact with educators who across the world, uh, part you know, who heavily involved in different uh, types of art, d different genre. And so there, there's a real creative thing. The other thing looking at doing is things like poetry slams and other things. These are just interactive opportunities across the community where we interact like we would here, but we're interacting in multiple locations. So our ultra broadband network facilitates the ability to connect these institutions so they can do these high bandwidth uh, applications and then create opportunities around them. One of the others that uh, is being worked on right now, and it's in uh, the, uh, the Institute of Music, uh, does a, every year uh, several events where they do sing one day, two day, three day, and they go on for 48 hours or 72 hours, but they'll bring in artists and you know, they'll have an orchestra one, you know, one part of the day, they'll have special artists different parts of the day, and they create this, this virtual connected event from artists from all over the world. So there's, you know, real interesting things that, that are going on. The other things that you find happening here are cultural exchanges in the sense of uh, there was a uh, performance that was put on with music and dance where the actual dancers were in two different cities. They were in Cleveland and they were out in California. And they participated via high definition television in a virtual event where we had real actors participating with virtual actors in a exchange of uh, you know, uh, uh, of culture there that, that actually became a very innovative performance event. So there's, those are the kind of things that people are beginning to do, create the opportunities, identify how to use the technology, leverage that technology. Um, one of the things we've been able to do is really work and collaborate with a number of, uh, of technology innovators and leaders. Uh, we participate with, uh, you know, IBM and Cisco, which helped donate equipment to get our network up and running. So we're, we now have a gigabit network uh, throughout the greater Cleveland area, and as I said, are expanding regionally. 
um, and that's driven by Cisco right now and IBM is an operating and, and design partner that we use. You might have seen most recently, we, there was an announcement in the paper just the other day, Intel is committed to uh, Cleveland as a digital city and wants to help facilitate making Cleveland a really leading edge digital city. Um, there's a lot entailed in that. I mean, that's a, that's, a, that's a lot of things. It's not just one piece of technology, it's integration of technology, it's integration of applications and services. And they've made a long-term commitment to Cleveland, and so far they've only made this, this commitment to three cities. So we're one of three cities here in Cleveland that made a commitment to have three pilot projects a year where they would develop applications and innovative applications, whether it has to do with, uh, uh, you know, EMS and, you know, what we call first responder type of approach, whether it has to do with, uh, you know, mobility and whether it has to do with transportation, the water department, or just making e-government more efficient. Uh, so we can think about doing other things, save some money, you know, that's a good thing, but also take that money and spend that on, you know, very creative applications. Um, Sun has become a partner of ours and has donated into creating a, uh, a technology center, um, and they're working with Case Western and uh, IdeaStream, which is our public broadcasting group out here, who's looking at uh, very innovative ways to do um, uh, digital cataloging and the asset management piece that I mentioned. And what they're looking at is uh, doing basically IP video distribution using our ultra broadband network. And so they're creating a opportunity to do this asset management, be able to capture and distribute. Uh, and of course, IdeaStream being a public broadcast is one of the first really moving towards the digital age. And so now they're looking at ways to really be creative and, and do more innovative things with the kinds of broadcasting and the content that they have available to them. Uh, and they're also heavily involved in educational outreach. City Signal donated the fiber to us. Um, and then what we recently did is we developed a relationship with Adelphia and Time Warner. What this did for us is you saw our fiber footprint, but what they were able to do for us is really give us ubiquitous reach out throughout about a 14 county region. So we were able to create flat rate, flat infrastructure, so I can have gig service interconnections throughout 14 counties. And, and I had a fixed price model to do that, which is very innovative for, for the region and for us because we get this at a very good rate. And it takes away the barrier for a lot of institutions that couldn't buy that kind of access before. They were happy with a T1. Now they get a gig. Big difference. You know, can do a lot more. Can start thinking about other things. Can begin to share resources, offset cost. Can men begin to develop new and innovative applications. Um, some of the partners and the founders of uh, One Cleveland include Case, of course, with Lev, who really was the uh, brainchild behind it. But uh, you can see we have, you know, a lot of the local government. We have the city of Cleveland, the Cleveland Municipal School District, Cuyahoga Community College, the public libraries, uh, the Greater Cleveland Regional Transit Authority, public broadcasting station, uh, Cleveland State University and NORTEC, which is a nonprofit sponsor of the kinds of activities we have, looking at creating new and innovative technologies in the region, uh, whatever they may be. Um, the, the nice thing about this who, who, who's who in this community is you can see a broad-based community participation. And that's one of the valuable propositions to deploying this kind of infrastructure. Because any of you are familiar with the cost of deploying fiber and deploying equipment on fiber, and then managing and operating those kinds of infrastructures, they're not cheap. And you know, part of the problem we have is that's what the carriers see. The carriers see it's not cheap, and they don't want to deploy it unless you're, you know, they're making some money doing that. And what we've been able to do is leverage the donations that we've received via fiber and donations and equipment to initialize an activity that we can really lower that cost barrier of entry for a lot of these member institutions and partners of these institutions um, and, uh, and really open the door now to some very creative ideas. Um, we've also been getting a lot of recognition for Northeast Ohio. One of the advantages is sort of stepping off the ledge and making a commitment and starting to do some of this type of work is that people, you know, ask you how you get it done. And they want to, you know, what are you doing? Where are you going with it? How can we help? Which is another interesting uh, segue that occurs. But we've really received a lot of press. We were recognized, believe it or not, in Cleveland as being one of the top digital cities in the world. We were one of 18 cities recognized in the world, uh, which is pretty amazing. I mean, you know, you look at Cleveland and you say, how did that happen? 
Um, but uh, what we've created is, is a lot of buzz, and not only a lot of buzz, but we've created some real visual opportunities and some pilot projects that have really enabled us to uh, begin to expand the concept uh, throughout our community. Um, so we're getting a lot of press. Now there's value in this. What's the value in getting press or working towards press? Is that by getting this kind of international recognition, we get a lot of media attention, okay? What's the value of media attention? It communicates our, our mission, our goals, our objectives, what we're trying to accomplish within the community. And what it also does is it creates a vehicle to engage us with applications providers, applications developers, new tools, innovative ways of doing things. We're in, it's part of the enablement model, right? You've got to connect people, resources, and tools together so that you can make things happen. And that's part of what really happens through this recognition model is that we get connected with very innovative people who have wonderful ideas that can help the community begin to change the way it does business, help the community to transform. But the other opportunity has been really kind of a, a sidebar here, and it's, it's been working in our favor over the last uh, couple of years, is a lot of companies want to come here. They want to play in our sandbox now. So we have guys like Intel who come here and say, hey, I'm going to donate some money to help kick off a pilot application. I want to work at developing innovative tools in your community. I'm willing to help fund some of these pilot projects to, uh, to move things along. So the opportunity now is to get grants and donations to help fund and initiate some of these activities. So that helps accelerate what we're trying to achieve, which is the deployment of technology. Um, and as a result of that, even Intel recognizes, if you look, these are the cities that Intel recognizes as the top digital cities worldwide. And uh, one Cleveland is actually the only proper name, you know, it's the, the only not, uh, proper name on here, otherwise all you see is cities. So they've really recognized the one Cleveland initiative as a top city and a top initiative that they want to participate and invest in. Um, we, we, you know, as a result of this, one of the things we have to realize is that, uh, you know, fiber and broadband technology is one aspect of getting, you know, organizations connected. To create a broader reach, we have to look at things like wireless technologies. This is something that Intel is very interested in, is creating a digital community means that I have to create uh, the ability to get to a broader base of, of the populace, of the community. And so they're very focused on, you know, providing uh, wireless uh, services and our focus in the community is to fo is really on government applications on health care on services for the community uh, so looking at providing and creating an environment that uh, we can begin to look at things like e-health and distance learning and 911 services and we can look at that and how that advances the community how it helps health care emergency response you know how it uh, enhances the ability for you to interact with government, how it enhances the educational paradigm. Um, some of the, uh, the applications uh, that we're beginning to look at as, uh, as early pilots here, uh, not only you, you've got the concepts that we all are facing today, you've got the mobile phones, you've got wireless, hey, that's a, that's a great, wonderful thing, but what's, what's going to happen next? How do you really engage the community? How do you uh, do other things? And, so one of the ways we have to look at is creating a broader range or an umbrella of wireless types of technologies out here so we can get connected to more people, provide internet for the education, uh, health care services uh, in our area. Look at other aspects. What funds this kind of technology deployment? And unfortunately, it's not generally the user or the subscriber that funds this program. It takes initiatives that, that really have money behind them and that have cost savings that uh, result from the deployment of these technologies. So a lot of the things that we're looking at now are in the control, the monitoring type of areas and location finding areas because those are areas that government uh, can create and enhance services to the community. Uh, those are ways that uh, you know we can increase and improve safety. Those are ways that we can uh, improve the emergency response model. Uh, and, and you don't think about it, but very simple things like managing trucks and uh, inspectors in the community costs a lot of money. And you guys, who anybody who's in our community is hearing about the overtime in the police department, the overtime of fire, yada yada, you can go down the hill. And, and when you start really investigating what happens here, these guys are going back, you know, from the field to the office, they spend a couple hours writing reports, they do all kinds of other things that they could have easily done in the field. 
They could have exchanged information out in the field. They could be more mobile in the process of their services. Uh, the other things is automating the applications in such a way, so like for a city, if you want to get a building permit, you can get online, you can apply for that, now you have an automated trail to where the decisions are being made and you get a permit turned around in a day instead of two or three weeks. And then tie that to the inspector so the inspector can go out and finish it. We accelerate the building process. We make it easier for business to do, um, do work with the government. And therefore we save money and we also are creating an economic model that helps the economy in our area grow because more people want to do business here. So some of the examples, and you guys may be familiar with quite a few of these, but Corpus Christi is a municipal-led initiative. And when they started out, they were looking at it for, you know, what it did for their business. They were looking at it relative to uh, meter reading and, uh, you know, for gas and water. And what they found in the process in their pilot project as they started rolling that out, they not only got a tremendous amount of savings, but they also started generating new revenue. So they were able to really uh, justify the value proposition. Now you say, okay, that's a government app, yeah, yeah, what, great. But when you have something like that that engages and moves that type of technology as an early adopter, and you move it out into the community, then you can start thinking about and creating other applications that overlay that infrastructure. That first part of the model that we described, the connect, if you can't get connected, you can't do the other things, enable and transform. So. That's uh, one of the real value propositions that comes as a result of that. Um, Philadelphia is getting a lot of press, but both pro and con. The press is, hey, we're going to be Wi-Fi, and we're going to give everybody free Internet access. This is a wonderful thing, right? And at the same time, you have the carriers coming back and say, hey, wait, you can't do that. You're a municipal. You can't use public money to deliver that kind of service. So now the legislation in the state of Pennsylvania is pr basically taking away that privilege from every other municipality in the state. So, you know, part of the issues that you run into with these municipal-led initiatives are that, you know, they come off with a, a very interesting concept I think we could all buy into. We'd all love to have free Internet access out, you know, in the wireless world and be able to connect anywhere, anytime. Um, but we also have the other side, which is the carrier side, that says, hey, I've got to make money doing this. What are you doing? You know, because you're really eroding the opportunity for me to develop a business model that I can support. And so what you really wind up seeing now is more collaborations. And that's partly where we kind of have come in as we've looked at this is we need to collaborate with the carrier community. We need to collaborate with technology vendors. We need to build a participative model to roll out infrastructure sooner in the Cleveland area and in the Northeast Ohio area because there is an advantage in doing so. Uh, some other places that are you know, moving along pretty quick are Tempe and Broward County. And, and they're all looking at broadband infrastructure for a variety of reasons. And they tend to generate out of universities or out of major institutions that have a need or a demand in it or an open architecture where, you know, come one, come all. Um, and so you see a lot of those initiatives being led more from an educational perspective. So from uh, the leading wireless initiatives that we're seeing in Northeast Ohio right now are coming out of our libraries. Uh, Cuyahoga Community Libraries, who I mentioned earlier was in participation with the uh, Cleveland Museum of Art, is looking at ways to reinvent itself and to engage the community and using wireless as, as a hot spot. So you can go to the libraries and have wireless access or, hey, to the free public spaces outside of the wireless uh, have access. So you have the libraries heavily involved. You have the museums. University Circle is a great example. Uh, you know, the museum is creating a very innovative uh, uh, architecture, they have wireless today, but now they're going through a major retrofit. And they envision the museum changing the way it interacts with, with, uh, with folks like ourselves who want to come in and visit and look at art and learn more about that art. And what they're creating is an interactive tools and applications that are tying wireless and RFID tags and different tracking and, and, and different connection technologies so they can develop applications that track the user, track uh, what art is out there, track different, uh, um, you know, uh, information and knowledge that represents that art and connect it all to the user as he's walking through the museum. So, and the idea is you take a Game Boy kind of model and you have a tool with a high, you know, a very high resolution screen, you tie that with RFID to the art in the area and 
you follow that and you can select and manage and control uh, your experience in the museum. And it's all about control of your experience. How do you manage and use and interact? And so very creative things going on in that direction. The universities, of course, have heavily, and those of you that are at Case know that Case is one of the largest wireless campuses, and one, it was one of the first, actually, in the country. There are over 1,280 wireless access points that cover the uh, university circle and university campus. Now, you know, that was a very early implementation. You know, the technology tends to evolve and change, and now we're looking at more ubiquitous coverage uh, types of applications. And so, uh, just in some discussions that we've had with Case Western recently, is looking at some of the new technologies, is how do we do video conferencing via wireless? How do we, you know, create a mobile experience where we can do high definition through wireless? Uh, you know, creating that common experience, whether you're a wireless connected uh, user or you're connected via fiber. So very interesting things there. The other things we're seeing within the community is things like the Cleveland Clinic, and you might, any of you that have read the paper in this area for the last uh, couple of months, has seen that the clinic has donated 10 million to the Cleveland Municipal School District, and the whole concept there was to get them connected via gigabit services out at the middle, special, and high schools with the purpose of creating program and content for interactive educational learning. They realize, and what happens in our community is you have to engage the the uh, members of the community, kids, you have to engage them earlier, you have to get them involved so they, you know, move into more math and science and healthcare practices, you have to bring them in. And so what they're doing is developing a program to home grow nurses and doctors and, you know, create a channel. So they're beginning a more participative educational model and they're doing that through broadband technology. They're actually going to be doing ultrasound, uh, you know, and, and other MRI and CTI kinds of uh, interaction and training and educating across the uh, the network. And this is all brought, all requires broadband connectivity. Um, and then the healthcare side is that the, most of the healthcare institutions are looking for ways, not only to engage within their institutions, but look at ways to engage. Uh, their patients when they leave. You know, what do you do when someone leaves the hospital? How do you manage their care? How do you track their care? If someone just had a heart bypass and left, you know, how are they doing? You know, how do you track that? How do you manage that? And so they're looking for innovative ways and, and wireless is one of those ways that they're looking at for easy access to devices and medical devices so that they can interact and exchange and collaborate. So some of the uh, the uh, future Northeast projects that are that are underway right now are NASA has a project with Case Western for develop you know heart devices and, and uh, for patients so they can do mobile tracking mobile management uh, types of services. Uh, there's other projects that are going on for intensive care. One of the big issues that everybody knows about in, in our communities today is health care, chronic health care, you know health management. How do we deal with those kind of things and building the types of tools and the applications, integrating those with device technology, et cetera, to help individuals manage their health more effectively, but also tie them into resources that can help them, and that's the doctors and the hospitals and other institutions. Um, E-learning has been around for years, but now it's how do I create a more engrossing, more engaging, and more interactive educational model using technology uh, so how do I use this broadband technology? How do I use high definition? How do I interact with different communities? How do I engage not only people in our region but outside of our region to become part of our educational process? So big initiatives in those areas. Um, so why do all this? Okay. I mean, I'm talking to stuff that might be really boring here. It says, okay, you're doing all this. You're putting this network. When's it going to be here? What is it going to do? It's a long process. It takes time. What we're trying to do is accelerate that process. What we're trying to do is engage the community, become a catalyst, so that we can enable new services, we can deploy new innovative applications, and we can increase the collaboration within our community. Uh, what does this do for us? Well, it creates new markets for us. If we can open up new markets, i.e., if you're doing business with the hospitals, or you're doing business with the hospital's patient, or you're doing business with education, or the government, if you can make it easier, open the door, create innovative applications, there's a value proposition for the community. It makes a better environment for the community. It opens up new business opportunities. If you make it easier for business to do 
you know, businesses come in and work with uh, our government, work with our health care, work with our educators, then you open the door to more, you know, and greater economy evolving in our region. And that's what it's all about. Uh, we've gained global attention and, and, you know, we hope to keep on that track to try to elevate Cleveland and maintain a status of a leading digital city and become one of the first in the U.S. to really you know, take that approach of you know, enabling and transforming the community to do innovative things. So we're reinventing ourselves to do e-government, things like e-medical records, public safety, urban technology, e-learning. And the value proposition we're getting is the cross-sector collaboration. Um, and the value proposition we're getting is that because we're in the early stage of this, we're really a sandbox. We're a test bed for a lot of technology vendors who want to come and pilot uh, new applications and new services. They want to come out here and partner with us. They partner with our, our health care and our educators and our government. Uh, so I'm in meetings, you know, every week. It's a, it's a new application, new service. And as a result of that, we're going to see a real paradigm shift in our community over the coming months and over the coming years because you're going to start seeing now real creative ways of, of doing business in our community. So that being said, that's, that's what One Cleveland is about. That's what we're trying to accomplish. 